Bamakwini Outdoor Radio is presented to you by anglerschoice.ca The Angler's Choice in Handmade Soft Plastics Also sponsored in part by Handlebars Musky Lures Zing the Bling Frantic Big Game Baits Case Trophy Fishing Fish NV Catch It You're listening to Bamakwini Outdoor Radio Hey folks, welcome to another episode of Ben McQuinney Outdoor Radio. Uh, there's a there's hundred ways you can catch a walleye, but one of the favorite ways is waiting for walleye. And on this uh, week's guest list is none other than the Bass Assassins, Rob Connolly and Robert Fox. Robert and Robert, welcome to the show. Hey Ben, how's it going? Good, good. So, tell us a little bit about yourselves, uh, Fox. What what do you do? Well, we've got this thing. We don't like boats all that much, so we like to strap on the old way the pants and just go sneak quietly into uh, our desired prey territory and stalk them down when they have no chance to resist. And Connolly, what uh, what's your what's your take on that? Well, that's, that's the biggest thing, and kind of what brought us together is that we fished the same shorelines for a while and. And, you know, we introduced ourselves to getting a little wet and finding bigger fish and better fish than the ones we were used to fishing alone. And, and the two of us together kind of push our limits a little bit and get us where we need to be to catch the big ones. Awesome. So I, I've tried uh, river fishing for walleye, and it's been unsuccessful. I think my only success has been uh, on the French River itself, and when you get out there, it's, it pretty much looks like a really big lake, but there's a current. So tell me what kind of, uh, what kind of gear does one need to get into river fishing for walleye? It's really quite that simple. A pair of uh, good wading boots, and if you don't want that, you can go most likely bare feet. A good rod, rod and a couple of cranks, and a bit of a sense of for adventure, and this is essentially what we do. The biggest thing is pushing our limits a little bit past that comfort zone. It's not a danger type thing, but you know you have to get into where the fish are, and you really have to push that extra step to make sure that you're you know staying safe, but, but getting out to where you know you can get on the fish. Uh, you know, not like those that are from shore, but you got to push the limits and get out a little further into the river, uh, so you're accessing the ones and the and especially the big ones that are that are out off the edge of the current. Yeah, and 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 that's that's the one thing too is is uh, you would you guys wear safety equipment, of course. Like if you get into um, a deeper deeper pocket with some some heavier current. Yeah, of course. Like you know, you got to make sure that you you know carry a weight stick if you need it. You have to make sure that you're being safe in that sense, where you know one goes ahead and the other one stays behind a little bit. In in that case, where you know there is that safety aspect involved. But as far as life jackets and stuff like that, you know, it's not something that really we push ourselves to that stretch of things where it's that dangerous. Like, usually it's us with our waders, you know, a solid bag that we can carry things in, whether it be a vest or, or an actual uh, backpack of some kind. But, you know, it, it, the big thing is just is being safe with that next step and, and, and using, you know, a lot of lightweight gear so you're not pushing the limits of, of pulling yourself under, I guess. Yeah. Now, when you say, when you guys say lightweight gear, what, what are we talking about? Medium light? light tackle yes absolutely like a medium fast spinning rod would do the job um, Rob prefers to fly rod a lot of times um, we go lightweight um, so small bags yeah. like, you know not much gear on you in the sense that you're not going to have anything on you you can't obviously recover if you, if you take that next step and it's a little bit further yeah. ahead so it's just when we say like, like gear it, it's more of this you know plan your days accordingly like don't lay yourself down with a bunch of water bottles and all that type of stuff and it, you are taking those things, you know, leave them on shore or something a little bit more like that. Like, you got to make sure you can recover weight-wise if you happen to go a little deeper than you wanted. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what are uh, what are some of the uh, favorite tackle uh, that you guys use uh, when hunting down the gold? Um, but when we go for uh, when we go for ice, um, a lot of times we use the same tactics that will apply to uh, to bass and to pike and musky too. So we fish and two, three, four, six feet of waters, pools sometimes up to eight feet. So what we like to use is uh, shallow running cranks. Um, 
drop shots are good bad when we hit when we, when we hit them hard just behind boulders and stuff um we don't go too much into jigs spinner baits are sometimes a good choice but the preferred weapon for us like the first thing that flies out is usually going to be a shallow crank um something that runs like one or two feet deep that can even in the heavy current does not get pushed down in the obstacles so, um so like a wake bait like that, yeah yeah the drop shots themselves work, you know, like that seems to be our go-to. When we find that you can't crank them quickly or, or you know, medium fast through, uh, going to a drop shot in a slower presentation and, you know, whether it be some type of uh, a goby or a shad or, or something like that hanging off. We have gone to live minnows in some cases when mm-hmm. you know, we hit areas that we're not necessarily familiar with because it tends to draw uh, the odd bite that, you know, normally wouldn't take something that's moving a little faster. So, you know, drop shot, you know, hook on the, like, you know, weight on the bottom, hook that foot and a half up, and just kind of bounce it through the edge of that current into the slower running behind the rocks and that type of sense. So what are the what are the kind of structures that we're looking for on a river? Like, uh, compared to a lake, generally you're going to be looking for drop-offs and, and uh, humps and whatnot where, where they tend to stack up. On a river, you have you don't have the same structure. So the thing that we look for the most when it comes to rivers is, you know, you got to think of it like a lake in that same sense. You're dealing with bigger depths and such in a lake, but on on the smaller rivers, you're you're just dealing in a smaller scale. So they're going to move from that 12 feet up to that 6 feet, where opposed to in a lake, you're going from 20 to, say, 12. It's it's the same type of concept that you're using. Mm -hmm. You're just bouncing in much smaller details. So the structure you're looking for is you're looking for rock edges, you're looking for big boulders, you're looking for the spot where the current really slows down just off to kind of play through and a lot of the fish themselves will feed in the edge of the current so you want to find that happy medium between shallow and deep I agree in general like walleyes are ambush predators and mm-hmm. they like they can tolerate some sort of current but in general they like to hang out in the more slack waters and this is what we look for when we read the water we, we see where there's an oddity in the behavior and in the flow of the river and this is what we target in general it would be caused by large boulders on the water or any other obstructions where the walleye like to hide and hang out for the day occasionally darting into the current and just snap their prey and then just go back and chill and be relaxed and this is what we target this is what we look for and looking for those spots in general can eliminate large stretches of water so it's all about knowing and thinking what's going on under there excellent excellent great tips guys uh tell us a little bit about yourselves well i um you know, I, I sell suits for a living, so for me, uh, it's a uh, you know a great day off type gig. You know, wearing a suit every day and, and dressing up kind of in the you know formal side of downtown Ottawa, and then to be able to spend my days in wade gear and you know grunged up in the wilderness going for adventures is really kind of what I love the most about Ottawa itself. Like you get this, these things, you know, in, in the city. One of our favorite fishing spots is right downtown. You can almost see Parliament in most cases. So for me, like it's you know I, I have that corporate world slash you know like to spend my days off where no one can find me and i can shut my phone off a little bit yeah exactly we try to spend like every every three minutes that we have away from our jobs and, and the girlfriends and everything we try yeah. to be out on the water as much as we can well and and uh i don't want to spoil it for anybody but uh anybody who hasn't seen the poster uh gord Pizer is going to be on uh the show tonight and uh the one thing that he stressed to me, that he stresses to, to all uh, people that he talks of, uh, to, is time on the water yes. outweighs all the information you could ever plug into. No such bad, no such thing as a bad experience. The more you do, the better it is. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the bad days themselves bring on things that you won't find. Like it's one of those things where a, a, a bad day for us is obviously not catching a you know, the big fish, but those are the same days that you'll learn the most about the water systems they are. You know, you might get a high current day. It teaches you things about the water. You get a low, you know, lying river system that you're not necessarily used to. And those teach you things too. And, you you know, your time on the water is, is irreplaceable, really. You can read as much as you want, but the more you get out on the water and the more you do. So we agree in that sense that it's, it's, it's definitely the importance is, you know, spending an hour here, an hour there, a full day here, a full day there. It doesn't really matter. The more on the water you are, the more successful you will be when the perfect day arrives. It's a constant, ma- constant mastering the learning curve, and it never stops, which is amazing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, 
the more time you spend on the water. And even those bad days uh, where you're skunked or you get a couple hits or a couple follows, you still learn something. The water still the, the any, water any still bad you. day on the water is better than any good day at work. That's what we <laughs> that is the slogan, isn't it? Yeah, it is, and it beats sitting on the couch getting fat. So yep. true, true. You know, a lot a lot of people th- would say, "Well, what do you do for outdoor exercise?" And I say, "I go fishing." Well, that's yeah. not exercise. You know, oh, well, you have fishing gone fishing with me. Ivy Current also <laughs> yeah, works exactly. on, uh, on all those necessary uh, muscles that are needed in a workout. So we need the gym membership for Christ's sake. <laughs> Yeah, you don't need to... D- Mother Nature provides the greatest gym. Yes. <laughs> it's free, which is the thing that, you know, yeah. what people don't understand is that, you know, it doesn't take a lot to be a fisherman, especially a wading fisherman. Like, Rob and I kind of did this outside of, of, of things that we do in our normal life, and we're not the type of person to throw a lot of, you know, financial things into our fishing. Like, it we're, doesn't it, take much away from it. We're minimalistic in that sense. So, yeah. you know, it, when we first started out, it's a rod and a couple, you know, a trip Canadian Tire to get some things, or a couple of trips to any tackle store to get some things, and you know what, you can start off small, and that's the biggest thing, is it doesn't take a lot to get started in this, and to get your exercise outside. Exactly, exactly, good point. Well, folks, that is all the time we have for my special guests, Rob and Rob, the Bass Assassins. Uh, you guys have a contest going on right now, don't you? Yes, all I right. do a giveaway. Well, plug away, boys. It's on Facebook, guys. Check it out. Uh, Bass Assassins are very excited to announce their pro staff signing with Power Team Lures. Congratulations, guys. Yeah, and thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's something we're very excited about. We mentioned the drop shot aspect of our game, and you know whether it's walleye or bass or, or whichever. It's, it's, a great, it's a great signing for us in the sense that we're uh, definitely going to get on a lot of fish thanks to them. Is there anybody else you want to plug? You know, I, I, we, we have something kind of cool that, you know, we do wait a lot and stuff like that, but we want to throw something out to Milton Outdoors a little bit. Like, they're local Ottawa guys here, and they've, you know, given us a lot of love, and, you know, they've introduced us to a boat, not necessarily to fish from, but to get us to some places where no one else can fish from. So we still wait from those places, but, you know, they really get us on some fish. And, of course, uh, Fish Bum uh, Outfitters has is, is, been great to us since the Hail fall. Fish Bum. And, you know, we can thank them for a thousand things so far, and, and our relationships with both of those are uh, are continuing and, and, and fantastic. Yeah. And also, um, if, uh, if folks out there in Facebook world don't know, uh, Rob, Rob and I have a collaboration in the Obsessive Compulsive Fishing Behavior page on Facebook, so if you guys uh, suffer from this uh, ailment, uh, please come and like the page, uh, enjoy the jokes, the tips, what have you, and uh, we'll, we'll be glad to have you as part of the, the group of obsessive compulsive fishing behavioralists. <laughs> nice. Rob and Rob, thank you kindly for being on my show today. It was a wealth of knowledge, and uh, I I come away with a better knowledge of how to track down the gold eyes in the rivers around me. Excellent, Ben. Thank you. Thanks for having us. We'd be happy to do this again. Excellent. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Bye. Ben McQuinney Outdoor Radio is presented to you by AnglersChoice.ca The Angler's Choice in Handmade Soft Plastics also sponsored in part by Handlebars Musky Lures, Zing the Blink, Frantic Big Game Baits, Case Trophy Fishing, Fish NV, Catch It. You're listening to Ben McQuinney Outdoor Radio. All right, folks, welcome back to Ben McQuinney Outdoor Radio. You know, we all have pets, whether they be fish. Uh, birds, cats, dogs, hamsters, skunks. But how many of you can say they have a pet muskie? My next guest is uh, uh, co-founder of the Georgian Bay Muskie Association, Michael McKee. Michael, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me tonight, Ben. How are you? Good, good. So... Is it true we can now adopt muskie? 
Absolutely. In conjunction with McMaster University, the Georgian Bay Muskie Association has set up a an Adopt a Muskie program. So for a contribution to our research efforts, you can actually kind of, I wouldn't say own, but you can adopt your own Georgian Bay Muskie, and we will provide you with some interesting scientific information about that fish throughout the year. That information is going to include stuff like how far it travels, where it generally is, what it's doing, how how many times we see it throughout the year, if it gets caught by anglers, that sort of thing. So you would basically put a tracking device on it of some kind? Yes, currently we have 21 fish in southern Georgian Bay that are equipped and tagged with radio frequency identification tags. Mm -hmm. And through that, through the device we just recently purchased, we can then tag these fish and we can monitor their movements throughout southern Georgian Bay over the course of the next three to five years. That's fantastic. Now, when you do, uh, do, do you go and um, track these, and when you do track them, uh, what are the things that you're looking for when you do catch one of your tagged uh, adopted muskie? Well, if an angler is out on Georgian Bay and they happen to come across one of the tagged muskies, the first thing they're going to notice is a, a, whip, a whip antenna. It's a thin wire coming out of the rear of the fish. And it's going to be between two and three feet long, and that's going to be the first thing. Mm -hmm. Once you notice that, you want to get in contact with either the Ministry of Natural Resources, the Georgian Bay Muskie Association, or the McMaster Research, the McMaster Research Group that's responsible for this project. From there, we'll be able to kind of tell you about the fish, when we first tagged it, how long it's been tagged, and kind of the movement patterns. But the biggest thing is to make sure that that fish is safely released back into Georgian Bay so that we can continue tracking it in the future. Absolutely, absolutely. So practice safe uh, catch and release with uh, the tagged muskie. Um, yeah, it's really critical. We had two of the fish that we tagged last year were caught, identified by anglers as fish that were tagged, were released, and then later found to be healthily moving about Georgian Bay. And we just recently had one of the fish that was caught or was tagged this spring, caught in southern Georgian Bay as well, and that picture was reported to the MNR. So it's good to see that catch and release does work. We're seeing it with positive reaffirmance from these fish. Now, how old are these fish when you tag them? Um, that's a great question. We have fish ranging from the mid-30-inch class all the way up to the largest, which is the mid-50-inch class. So these fish are anywhere from, say, 7 to 18 to 20 years old. Obviously, we can't know that without measuring the clethrium, but that kind of defeats the purpose if we kill the fish to find out how old it is. Yeah, and yeah, exactly, exactly. So, uh, what to get involved? What, what kind of uh, monetary donation are, is uh, the GBMA looking for? Well, we're looking for anything. Any money, any money we collect, either through T-shirt sales, through membership, is going back directly to the fishery. We've so far we've collected over $10,000, and we've put that all directly back into the fishery to help support this research project and the Georgian Bay fishery. For the Adopt a Muskie program, if you would like your own fish, the tags themselves, the tracking tags we're inserting, are retailing at $250. So either as an individual or as a group of people, if you would like to adopt a muskie and kind of we can provide that information for you, we're looking for a donation somewhere in that $250 range. And you look at that, and that's your average uh, entry level to musky fishing uh, in the line in in the realms of a rod and reel combo. So, two hundred fifty. Absolutely. Two hundred fifty. Sorry, go ahead. Two hundred and fifty dollars is a pretty good investment when you can walk away from it and say, "Oh yeah, I have a I have a pet musky uh, swimming around in Georgian Bay." Well, and that's really the cool thing. Like, you all have people in your lives that you don't know what to buy them for Christmas or birthdays, and how many people can go and say that I have a pet Georgian Bay Muskie, and you can put the picture on your desk, and we can provide you information updates. It's a really good way to do it. So what spurred this, Mike? Um, really, it was just my passion to give back to Georgian Bay. I've been going up to the Bay. This is my sixth season full-time on the Bay, and after being there for so long and really enjoying the the resource that it is, I just wanted to find a way that I could give back. And there's really no better way that I could think of than devoting this time, devoting the effort to getting the awareness to the people to ensure that the Georgian Bay muskie fishery and Georgian Bay as a whole can be passed down to future generations so that they can enjoy it as much as I have. What do you, where's the future of uh, GBMA? Where do you see it in five years? 
It's going to continue to grow. We're getting involved with a lot of great research groups, and as we get the word out, more and more people are wanting to get involved. So we hope to continue to not only continue this research in southern Georgian Bay and northern Georgian Bay, but we want to continue the research throughout all of the different areas, go up to places like the Moon River, go to all the areas up to the North Channel through the south, and see what we can do to improve all of the areas. It's great to look at one or two areas at a time, but there's other areas that could be neglected, so it's important to be able to pass the entire resource down to future generations. Exactly. And and this this sort of research uh, only benefits the muskie fishery as a whole. Absolutely, and since muskie are a keystone species that kind of indicate the health of the fishery as a whole, it's not only going to help muskie fishermen. This is what I've been trying to pass on to cottagers and resident, residents and other boaters, is that it helps the bass population, the walleye population, especially with the threats of low water, the Asian carp invasion. The more research we do now on the alpha predators, the more research and the more information we're going to have for all the other species to make sure that there's a consistent ecosystem, a healthy ecosystem developing for the next few years so that we can continue that into the future. Excellent. Well, uh, t- tell us a little bit about uh, a little bit about yourself. Uh, what? what uh, how did you uh, get started in musky fishing? I think, like a lot of people, it was the stories and the fish that really got me hooked in musky fishing. We all remember that first musky we catch. We all remember the first time that a big 40-inch or 50-inch fish comes to the side of the boat, and it just makes you makes your knees shake. So that was really what brought it on for me, being on Georgian Bay and hearing the stories of the 55-pound fish, the 60-pound fish, the 65-pound Ken O'Brien fish. It's kind of yeah. the elusive it's the elusive right of Georgian Bay to have a big fish. And a lot of people have them on their wall, but to pass on that information that it doesn't have to be put on your wall. Yeah, exactly. It's the big fish stories. Yeah. It's unlike anything else. <laughs> and uh, school-wise, uh, what did you? Where did you, where did you go and what did you study? I finished my undergrad at the University of Waterloo in environmental engineering, focusing on of all things, water, and I'm currently at the University of Toronto doing a master's in drinking water research. Ah. All of it's kind of been towards the water end of things, surface water, drinking water, wastewater, all the different things that can impact the water ecosystem of Georgian Bay and of anywhere else. So it's been, well, the education has helped me through the GBMA as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So uh, what's the website? Uh, we currently have a website in development, but you can reach us and get the most up-to-date info at our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Georgian Bay Muskie Association. Excellent. Anybody or anything else you'd like to plug, Mike? Uh, I would like to thank you for this opportunity to pass the word about the Georgian Bay Muskie <laughs> Association. If anyone would like to get involved, help out, see what the tracking is all about, feel free to email me at Association at gmail.com. We're always looking for volunteers to come out and help track. It looks to be a busy summer, so I would love to have the, I would love to have some help, and I'd love to get to know some more Georgia Bay muskie fanatics. Yes, and uh, muskie season uh, is just about to take off uh, very shortly in the next 48 hours, I believe. Yes, the inland lakes will be opening Saturday, and Georgian Bay in two weeks, so it's kicking into high gear. Excellent. Well, Michael, thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you very much, Ben. I hope you have a great night. Excellent. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. All right, folks, now it's time for The Rant with Cooper Gallant. Hey, everyone. Again, glad to be back on Ben McQuinney Outdoor Radio. My two previous rants were about snagging fish and getting kids into fishing. And this week, I'll be doing a quick rant on catch and release. No body of water has a limitless supply of fish, and we need to catch and release so more fish can spawn and be caught again when they're even bigger. It's not bad to keep the limit, but the thing that ticks me off the most is when people catch and keep an illegal amount of fish. Eating fish is fine, but we have to take into consideration that if everyone to go fishing and keep the limit, tons of fish would be killed and our fish would slowly go downhill. Practice catch and release. Thanks everyone for listening. This is Cooper Glant, 60 Second Rant. Hey folks, if you like what you hear on Ben McQuinney Outdoor Radio, be sure to drop us a line at Ben McQuinney Outdoors at Yahoo.com.
All right, folks, welcome back to Ben McQuinney Outdoor Radio. My next guest is the field editor for In Fisher Magazine, fishing editor of Outdoor Canada Magazine, which has 2.2 million readers. Uh, they refer to him as Dr. Pizer, the most scientific angler in Canada. My next guest is none other than Gordon Pizer. Gord, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ben. I, uh, I've been looking forward, actually, to, uh, to doing this with you. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you. So, we're staring down the barrel of the musky opener, and walleye has already been in full swing uh, for the last month or so now. Uh, and our topic tonight is uh, chasing down gold. Yeah. You, you know, it's funny. Our our walleye season opened uh, a week ago um, in <clears throat> northern Ontario. I'm, I'm up here in Kenora, mm -hmm. Lake of the Woods, and, and our season opens always the third Saturday of May. And then the cool thing this year, I had my uh, uh, seven-year-old and ten-year-old grandsons open the season with me, and my seven-year-old caught a muskie on uh, the opener. <laughs> There you go. How big? It wasn't that big, but I mean, it was his first ever. Yep. And it was, uh, I, I'm guessing, about 36, 37 inches. Oh, he's but, hooked now. Uh, yeah, and one of those, uh, but beautiful silvery, you know, when they're young like that, mm -hmm. they've got that silver blue, uh, almost a phosphorescent to them. Yeah. And, and we got an over four smallmouth by total accident. We uh, caught the biggest sauger. I have ever seen personally live, and the boys had three walleyes in the boat before I had finished rigging up our rods. That's fantastic. How cool is that? Yeah. We, we, they kept count, and in one, the first hour of the season, we got 30 walleyes. Wow. That is unbelievable. So would you say Lake of the Woods is a uh, walleye factory? Um. Yeah, you know, yes, it, it, it definitely is. Um, but the one thing I would say, well, Lake of the Woods, I mean, it's just a phenomenal fishery. Um, we have 47 species in it. Um, <clears throat> but it's, and, and I mean, it is a tremendous walleye fishery, but it's not a big fish fishery. No. So, un unlike Quinty and uh, several other spots. Yeah, you know, if if you're looking for the trophy of a lifetime, it's if it, I wouldn't recommend coming to Lake of the Woods. But you know, um, what I lo love doing with a lot of folks is if they've never caught a lot of fish before, I, I can virtually guarantee fifty to a hundred walleyes every day. Wow! So it's a numbers. Yes. Yeah, and you know what? There's there's people out there that uh, like to play the numbers game, and that's. That's what they, they want. They want the numbers. And there's others uh, like myself who want that uh, that big one. <laughs> and, and I'm kind of like you, Ben. So, you know, once uh, if, if I'm out on my own, I'm, I'm playing around, uh, always playing on the edges. And But, but the reality is, uh, no, I, I fished this several little uh, uh, tournaments and deals here for walleyes over the years. Um, and I did fish one that was a catch photo release. Uh-huh. And uh, so the best six for that, it was a it was a seven to eight pound average, and that was in August. So I mean, there's nothing wrong with catching, you know, six, seven, eight pound walleye. Oh goodness, no! I'll take that all day. Exactly. Um, we we're talking about big fish, and it just—I've never seen you catch a small fish, and and in fishermen <laughs> or or fishing with with Bob Azumi. I've never seen you pull up a small fish. What's your secret? And and if you don't want to give me your secret, do you end up pulling up the odd dink here and there? Oh, shoot, Ben. <laughs> um, and, and, I mean, there are no secrets. Uh, last year, um, I, I, I think we might have chatted about this at the Odyssey this year, but this is the, the honest truth. Last year, uh, we caught more, a uh, couple of buddies and I, but we honestly caught more walleyes over 10, between 10 and 15 pounds, um, <clears throat> than any previous decade. And, you know, we've been working on big fish techniques. Mm -hmm. And kind of like you, and, and, you know, it's a bit of the musky rub-off as well. Um, 
really what excites us. We, we all go through those phases when you're starting off as an angler. You just want to catch a fish, and then, then when you've, you're starting to catch fish, you want to catch numbers, and then all of a sudden the numbers are less important and big fish become the real prime thing. So <clears throat> we've narrowed down two or three presentations. And we will pass up the uh, we'll pass up the fifty, seventy, eighty fish days, and you know we'll we'll fish for maybe eight to ten bites. Mm-hmm. Um, and it goes with all species. Ben, interestingly enough, uh, I was out on uh, um, Reindeer Lake in northern Saskatchewan last year, um, and actually went up on the the last week of the season that the camp was open. And we said, it was funny, at noon, the guide said to me, Gord, that's your 70th Northern today. <laughs> and honest truth, I said, George, I, this is great, great fun, but I want, we're really looking for big fish. So we put together a big fish pattern there, uh-huh. and honest truth, Ben, when we found what we were looking for, in 14 casts, we caught seven Northerns uh, between about 24 and 32 pounds, and one of them was the biggest northern caught in Reindeer Lake last year. Oh, goodness gracious. So establishing a pattern for, for big walleye, what, is it, what does it entail? Like, are we using large baits? Because I always hear the, the adage, big baits, big fish. Or are we targeting larger schools of, of walleye and, and kind of seeing, is there big fish down there? Honest truth again, um, and, and I know that many people, many of the, the listeners are going to say, well, you know what, I, I've gone through schools and caught 25 or 30 fish, and then I popped a big one. But if we're catching, if we mark a school of fish, and, and we might catch five or six, and, 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 and again, don't misunderstand me, I'm, I, I love catching walleye of any size, mm-hmm. but if we're targeting the big ones and we're in, and we're catching 17, 18, or 19 inches, um, we leave. Yeah. That's, that's simply not what we're looking for. Because and, and I don't begrudge anyone who says, well, I, I want to catch those. By all means, you go do that. Um, because I would say always... a half to three quarter Sorry, ounce ahead. jig is small for us. Uh, we're throwing three quarters to one, one ounce. Oh my that, goodness. That's, that's, that's our very basic pickup jig. And, and a five inch swim baits are probably the, the smallest we throw. Uh, six inches are normal. And believe it or not, Ben, we're throwing those three quarter, uh, and one ounce jigs. We're throwing those sometimes in eight to nine feet of water. Huh. So, so now ask yourself, if you're throwing a three quarter ounce jig with a six inch swim bait that weighs in total package combination, that's weighing probably an ounce to an ounce and a half, there's only one way you can fish that. And that's aggressively, mm-hmm. and, and that is part of the secret. Uh, um, you know, uh, you fish them aggressively, and you fish them with big fish baits, and you'll blow your mind how big the fish are. And so many people, I, I, this is an example I talk about in the seminars that I give all the time. Guys and gals will look out the window in the summer, and you will see a bright blue sky, yeah. and it's uh, maybe it's 30 Celsius or 75, 80 degrees, no wind. And you know what everybody says to themselves, it's going to be a tough day walleye fishing today. And and what they will do is they'll pick up a little six, six and a half foot jigging rod, six pound test line, put yeah. on a quarter ounce or a, a, an eight ounce jig. And finesse them. And, and you know what, Ben? It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. You, you, it's a tough day. Yeah. We, we go out under those conditions, and honest truth, we love it when it's flat, calm, super hot, the water's warm, the walleyes are eating 3 to 5% of their body weight a day, yeah. and you fish them aggressively, and you'll blow your socks off the kind of fish you can catch. So large baits, aggressive uh, presentation is the key to big walleye the 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 other thing i would say of course and you know this um you go to big fish waters mm-hmm. so the bay of quinty is a good example um <clears throat> we used to have a contest in ontario here um and, and it was the molson big fish contest it was uh-huh. used to be huge and uh, in the walleye division 
there's a lake, and it happens to be called Dogtooth Lake. It's about uh, 20 miles from Kenora. And Dogtooth, uh, during the Molson Big Fish Awards, it used to take about 10 to 20 percent of the entries in the walleye division. So very obviously, uh, Dogtooth Lake is a big fish fishery. So uh, you want to catch a big walleye. Yes, you can catch them almost anywhere, but in most lakes, it's almost by luck. And, and in many, many waters, the Kawarth is probably being a good example, um, you know, they don't get to be, there, there aren't a lot of 10-pound fish. It, it, it takes unique conditions. Dogtooth happens to be uh, a very, very uh, early mesotrophic, late oligotrophic, almost a lake trout water, and mm-hmm. kind of like the Bay of Quinty when you get out towards Lake Ontario. For a whole bunch of good reasons, those kinds of waters produce big fish. And so it's what we look for. Um, the the one the one thing that I I didn't mean to interrupt you prior, but the one thing that had always been passed on to me is when you're out fishing for 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 that one fish, if you like you said you leave after you bang off half a dozen small ones because in a school of fish. If they're the same size, fish after fish, that's the size of that school. Yes. As a general rule, Ben, that is what we find. Um, <clears throat> for sure, there are exceptions. Um, and, and we've all been in a situation where, whether it was bass or walleyes or whatever, you you know, you catch uh, 20 or 30 of them, and then all of a sudden a big fish shows up. But you know what, my experience, and I think uh, many others as well, and it's certainly a principle we've seen in a lot of the bass tournaments we fish, the biggest fish you're going to catch is often the first one. Yeah. And, and if so, if you, if you then catch one, two, three, five, ten, and they're all running the same size, uh, if you're looking for that trophy of a lifetime or a big fish, as hard as it is to do, time to pick up and leave. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, I just want to get a generalization for for the uh, listeners. Lake of the Woods versus, say, Lake Erie. In the style of structure, what are we looking at? The 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 problem, if you will, with Lake of the Woods for a newcomer <clears throat> is if I were to show you a map, uh, you, you a, a contour map of the lake, you'd be blown away. <clears throat> uh, Fourteen thousand islands. Mm-hmm. 65,000 miles of shoreline um, and, and 14,000 islands above water and probably 28,000 two inches under and or more. So it is, it's complex in terms of structure. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the principles we've always taught it in fishermen and, and in our seminars, whatever, um, as a general rule on, on Canadian shield type lakes like, like Lake of the Woods and Rainy and, well, shoot, uh, most of the lakes on the shield. Mm-hmm. It's hard to find walleye that are not associating with structure, but not all structure has walleye. So you gotta keep, it's interesting, I'm actually working on a bit of a blog on this right now. Uh, I was doing some seminars, actually some store openings for the Cabela's folks. Mm-hmm. I was out in uh, Edmonton and, and uh, Saskatoon and Winnipeg, <clears throat> and I, a couple of folks, when we were chatting, they said, you know, I, I really don't have the patience for fishing. And you know what? Patience is not a good thing. Um, I, I don't have that patience either. So don't go out and sit on one spot especially on a complex, structured lake like Lake of the Woods, you keep moving, 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 and then eventually uh, you will strike pay dirt, you will strike gold. Mm-hmm. And, and that is the secret. It's not sitting, waiting for the fish to come to you. It's for you to find that pattern and put the daily pattern together. Yeah. And like you had said to me at the Odyssey, um, people that, uh, that have their favorite species to target or want to target – um, it is absolutely time on the water. It, it, nothing replaces it. I mean, uh, folks can watch the television shows. C- folks can can uh, read the magazines, and you should do all of those sorts of things. Watch the Internet, uh, YouTube stuff. But nothing at the end of the day, Ben, as you know, 
uh, replaces getting in the boat and going out and fishing. And and I'll tell you the other thing, and I think we did we talked about this as well. Nothing beats hiring a good guide. Absolutely. In in one or two days on the water with a top guide, you will learn more in one or two days than you will in one or two years trying to do it on your own. And and if folks want to get in it and and take that crash course, uh, I would recommend hire a guide, but then say to him or her, uh, I'm not just interested in catching fish. Show me how to slow death. Slow me how. Show me how to Lindy rig. Show yeah. me the proper way yeah. to, to fish lead core line. Like we're smacking them on lead core uh, in the summertime, pulling pulling uh, crankbaits on lead core line, and and people will say, well, why why would you use lead core? And the answer is, you can take a little tiny shad wrap that goes down eight or ten feet. Mm-hmm. I can put that at forty two feet where a walleye's right. never seen it before. That's right, and it's simply a matter of using lead core. So. You go with a guide who's a great lead core uh, specialist, and and there's lots of guys on the Great Lakes and wherever. You will learn, Ben, more in one day, two days on the water than you could possibly learn in a year on your own. Absolutely, 100%. I couldn't agree with you more there. Uh, A few of my friends are guides and uh, have had the opportunity of being in the boat with them and they're a plethora of knowledge and the best attitude... For, for you listeners out there to have, when you do hire a guide, leave everything you think you know about fishing at the dock and let that guide teach you because you will come away a better angler and have a better uh, experience out of it if you allow yourself to be taught. No, it's absolutely the case, Ben. And, and as I said earlier too, tell the guide what your expectations are. I mean, uh, if you really want to learn, say, you know, uh, please teach me two or three or four different techniques. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got a good friend uh, who fishes bass tournaments. He flew down to Lake Havasu uh, last year in, in the wintertime and met up with uh, one of the top guides on Lake Havasu specifically to learn a specific technique. And it wasn't the best time of year to do it. Uh, they didn't catch necessarily a lot of fish doing it, but he learned from a guy how to do it, and when that turns on this year, he's going to be a force to be reckoned with. Absolutely. Okay, let's get the debate out there, Gord. Is it walleye or pickerel? <laughs> it's a walleye for sure, Ben. <laughs> uh, pickerel are, are, are a member of the northern pike family. Uh, chain pickerel along along the east coast, and, and the funny thing is when uh, when our American friends come up and they hear us talking about catching wall uh, pickerel, they they envision uh, chain pickerel from the east coast. Um, they truly are walleyes, mm-hmm. member of the Zander family. They were actually from a, from a, a, a scientific naming perspective, they were renamed into the Zander family. They used to be a Spizostedium vitrium. And now they're Xanders. Um, and they're the largest member of the perch family. So they are yellow perch, or members of the perch family, and the, and the largest members in, in Ontario. Uh, Percadia, I think it is, the family. And, and the it, genus is Sander. Yes, I have, it, I have it right here in front of me on Wikipedia. <laughs> Knowledge is power. <laughs> uh, I heard... I heard uh, um, a, a phrase, uh, I'll paraphrase, but uh, Lake of the Woods, uh, as you pass, as I passed every point, I thought I was going to meet God. Is it that beautiful up there, Gord? You know, um, it truly is, Ben. Uh, uh, I, I, I make no bones. I mean, I'm ho- I hope I'm here for the next 20 or 30 years. But when my days are, are finished, uh, that's where my ashes are going to be scattered. Uh, on the lake here, um, and and it's interesting the the quote, and I actually wrote that quote, but it was from Guido Hibden, mm-hmm. and uh, Guido, of course, won the Bassmaster Classic, and uh, <clears throat> and and I, I actually did several stories uh, uh, back about ten, twelve, fifteen years ago with Guido. He came up with with Dion, uh, his son Dion, who yep. also fishes the Bassmaster and FLW circuits. And 
the first time he had ever been on the, the, the lake. And we held a big seminar downtown as part of KBI. And uh, Guido was there and Dion and myself and Bob Zumi, uh, Al Lindner, Alan Ron, and Jimmy. And Guido got up in front of several thousand people and someone said, what do you think about Lake of the Woods? And, and that's exactly what Guido said. Every time I came to an island and came around the corner, I expected to meet God. <laughs> that's a fantastic line. I love it. I love it. Um, so for our listeners out there, um, what is uh, the style of, of uh, gear that you want to have equipped to target these fish? Well, that, that's the other really neat thing about uh, Shield Lake and, and Lake of the Woods, or Rainy in particular, is that if you're a good jigger, it's a phenomenal jigging lake. If you love to troll uh, crankbaits or you like trolling uh, crawler harnesses, um, three-way rigs, bottom bouncers, it's phenomenal for that. Uh, it's, it is one of the advantages of, of having lakes that are as, as complex structurally and cover-oriented as Lake of the Woods is, is you can always find somewhere to do your favorite style of fishing. Um, so, the, you know, it, uh, the jigging is unquestionably the most popular. It's probably what everyone is doing right now. So, you know, one quarter to three-eighths, maybe a half-ounce jig. Um, most people are live bait oriented. I haven't bought live bait in probably five years. <clears throat> the scented soft plastics are every bit as good. But mm -hmm. if you feel more comfortable with live bait, uh, I mean, by all means, do it. Um, pulling, pulling, uh, uh, pulling uh, crawler harnesses is great up until about uh, the first to the middle of July, and then as you move into the more mid mid range summer. Um, then things like slow death and casting crankbaits on windblown points and shoals, that's really, uh, really comes into its own. Then in the fall, you know, they start bunching up and moving out onto deeper structures, but yeah. on, throughout that whole period of time, we're throwing our, our three quarter to one ounce jigs and the big swim baits and we're, we never let them, uh, venture more than about 12 inches off the bottom. Uh, we're fishing them fast. We're fishing them aggressively. Medium heavy action spinning rods, seven, seven foot two inches, 14 pound test fire line, 12 to 14 pound mono or fluorocarbon leader, mm -hmm. and then just go aggressive. Excellent. Gord, thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. And folks, I hope you've uh, uh, taken away uh, some great information here on, on targeting walleye. Uh, Gord Pizer is the uh, fishing editor for Outdoor Canada magazine, and you can also catch him on the uh, award-winning In Fisherman uh, with uh, uh, Doug Stang, I believe. You guys partner up and, and pull big fish out of the water and, and talk tactics. <laughs> and we do that, in fact, Ben, believe it or not, in, uh, I believe the show's airing in July, but Doug was up last year. And uh, the, the technique that I just talked about, that's going to be aired. And uh, I think we caught 12 to 20 walleyes in that uh, 7 to 10 pound range uh, in about an hour and a half, two hours fishing, exactly the way I just described it. That is fantastic. Yeah, so folks will get a chance to see us. Excellent. Uh, Gord, anything you'd like to uh, mention or plug? Now's your oh, chance. Not, not at all, Ben, just... Uh, you know, uh, especially for our Canadian uh, audience, uh, friends, uh, we live in the greatest country on earth in terms of uh, fishing. Uh, here in Ontario, we've got, uh, I think it's three-fifths of all the fresh water on earth. And, I mean, I'm in Kenora here. Between Kenora and Thunder Bay, we have 100,000 lakes. So, uh, folks, get out and do it. Enjoy yourself. Uh, um, we are truly blessed to live in this country and go out there, go fishing, and enjoy yourself. Excellent. Thank you again, Gord. Hey, my pleasure, Ben. All right, you take care. You too. Musical consideration provided by Animal Confession. Bright Light, Dark Eyes is out now. Buy it at www.animalconfession.com.
Bamaquinney Outdoor Radio is presented to you by AnglersChoice.ca The Angler's Choice in Handmade Soft Plastics Also sponsored in part by Handlebars Musky Lures Zing the Bling Frantic Big Game Baits Case Trophy Fishing Fish NV Catch It You're listening to Bamaquinney Outdoor Radio 